right, everyone. That was a super, almost peaceful kind of reintroduction back into the session. Um, it's been super great to see everyone in the digital sandpit there experimenting with the different templates and whatnot. And that's really what Mira is all about and how you best learn. So um, great to see your participation down there during the break. Um, so now we're going to move on to the next component of this workshop, and that is addressing and kind of embracing the more ambiguity process and um, kind of nature of research and how Alex and I both use Mira as a tool to help navigate that. Um, so to kind of just bring everyone in a bit, um, throughout this kind of workshop, we compare and contrast from linear thinking to design thinking. And when we think of linear thinking, it's more about when you have a process, it's a step-by-step, -step. you can't progress to stage two without having progressed, um, completed stage one, can't progress to stage three, having completed stage two, that kind of thing. And it's a very sequential process. And while I think we like to think of our research milestones and the research process as you know A to B to C to D, um, I think a lot of us will agree that it never quite works like that. And we found great benefit in embracing um, the ambiguity of the research process and actually aligning our thinking and our tools um, in accordance to that. And so we both come from a design thinking background and um, really the stages of um, design thinking really, uh, it's still five stages, but they're more iterative. So we have empathize, understanding the situation, defining the situation, ideating, moving to prototyping, then to testing. You might go back, oh no, we got some new information, we need to prototype again in that some, um, kind of capacity. And it really embraces this um, idea that um, when you open one door, the, the previous door closes, all of them are open and it's more of a fluid experience. Now, we're gonna try this again. Um, I've pre-set up this uh, poll, so bear with us. Um, what we're gonna do is actually um, vote on how well-versed um, you are in design thinking, how familiar you are with it. Um, you may be very familiar that you may use design thinking every day at work. It's just part of your vocabulary. You may be pretty confident. You may know a little bit about it or towards the other end, it might just be a great buzzword. You might just drop every now and then at work or this may be your first time hearing about it, which we're very excited about if, if this is the case. So what I'm going to do is click on the design thinking poll. I've already set it up. Start now right now so you should see if you transition back um, to your own screens and away from zoom there should be an option um, to vote now pop up i believe um, so if i this is the thing that pops up i'll click here i'll say that i'm done and i'm hoping that that might work for everyone but potentially not <laughs> Chat. Well, this is our first time. No vote option showing, sadly. You need to, someone had to, re, Laura had to refresh her browser for it to be able to vote. So that may um, be a consideration for everyone else. Some people didn't get the pop up this time. Otherwise, if you try and click down on the voting um, thing here, it may work for you. Awesome, Ryan can see the vote feature. Thanks so much for letting us know that. It is a much better outcome cool. than the last one. <laughs> and so what you can see here is definitely the more um, administrative side of it. If you were conducting your own um, on the Zoom call, um, you can see what we see. Yeah, I think a lot of people had to refresh their screens. Beautiful, so we've got about five seconds left before it finishes. Alrighty, let's see the results. This whole thing probably has a lot to process. Fantastic, this is what we want to see this time. Right. Awesome, so seven of you, the majority said you use design thinking every day in your work. Fantastic to know from our point of view. Um, for some, it's your first time hearing about it. 
I thought I was being a bit cheeky, adding it's a great buzzword to use. I'm a little bit sad that no one clicked <laughs> it, but that's okay. Um, great to know that everyone is familiar to some degree of design thinking. Perfect. So as you can see, um, it was quite a good tool to use there. I'm just going to wait for that to end. Maybe we should hit the refresh soon too. <laughs> <laughs> Do you reckon? Yeah, I think so. Okay, just there. Yeah, oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. And that's just the thing with Miri, sometimes you have to refresh. Okay, we're back into it. Beautiful. Ah, oh, we can see everyone moving along. Fantastic. Alrighty, so uh, considering everyone is quite well versed in design thinking, I'll give a, a brief overview. But essentially, design thinking is a term that represents a set of processes, be that cognitive, strategic, and or practical, that is usually employed by designers um, for huge human-centric problem solving. Um, so it's really useful in navigating ambiguity because it is an iterative process. Um, and I find it particularly useful um, to implement in typically linear processes or if you're dealing with people who are only used to linear processes and can't seem to get out of that um, set way of thinking. Um, my opinion of design thinking, controversial, not really, um, is that design thinking isn't an engine itself necessarily, and it really um, is fully realised when you do bring your specialisation and unique skill set to the table. Um, so if you are using design thinking um, skills to um, try and figure out a new system for financial services, it is still useful to have someone who specialises in financial services because then they help with the prototyping and the testing and whatnot. Um, so while it is useful to break up certain thinking, um, it definitely doesn't replace the fact that um, people's skill sets in a particular field are still really valued. And that's why it's really exciting to use um, in research, basically. Um, so I'm sure many of you are aware of the different types of tools and mapping techniques that you can use for in design thinking. The double diamond being the diverge and converge process is very common. Uh, but today what we'll be exploring is mind mapping um, in the last half hour, <laughs> basically. So if you come up here, that's wonderful. Um, mind mapping essentially is just a visual way to organise relationships and view relationships as a whole. And I found this particularly useful. Um, there's two ways you can do mind mapping and one the first one i'll describe to you is inside out and that's when you start in the center of the problem and work your way out and it's more exploratory and it enables a more structured ideation process um, so i put a simple problem um, in the middle here how can local 40 club better engage its members and then i incorporated the engagement framework being conscious attention social connection and enthused participation and so then people start aiding off well okay maybe uh, you know, conscious attention, including music during games, or maybe there's during game entertainment, um, or maybe for enthused participation slash conscious attention, there could be prizes or raffles or a gamification element um, to a footy game or that kind of thing. And so this enables um, a really useful tool in this <laughs> previa. Yes, Kevin. <laughs> um, this is really useful if you have a group of participants that tend to go off in all different directions and it's a bit of a herd of cats Herding cat scenario, we need to loop them back in. Um, it's a very useful mechanism to use. Um, and then moving on to the data driven mind mapping. Um, this is one that I find particularly useful in research. Um, and basically, you start with the data, and it's a very similar, obviously, to qualitative coding um, in that you do a first level group of coding based, you group, start to group based what's on the obvious, and then you go into the center here and start grouping that second level coding. So what are the relationships between each of those groups? Um, realizing the overarching um, relationships and just remember that you're seeking to derive meaning from these relationships. That's the purpose. It's not just to like push some in here, push some in there. Um, you want to derive meaning from it. And so you really do need to be curious and um, adopt an exploratory mindset for that. Um, so while everyone was learning about the technical skills, I was <laughs> madly trying to um, kind of mind map all of these different mythical creatures from a data-driven perspective. So as we can see here, I created um, three kind of first order effects, which I worked outside in, even though I'm explaining it inside out, where I have water-based creatures, so that's mermaids, easy, uh, flight-based creatures, either they have feathers, it's a phoenix, 
It can be spiritual, a ghost, that's <laughs> the word I came up with, or it can have scales. Um, it's a dragon, lots of dragons around there. And then I also included ones that were grounded, so actually um, on the earth, those are those that are within earth. So like the mandrake root, it grows inside. Um, on top of earth, I had um, Jabberwocky, Wendigo. I had to Google what this was and was uh, probably terrified of what that was. Um, and then those that are human-like, so the Lorax, the Gnome, and those are um, question mark around there. Um, so that was a rapid <laughs> mind map on my heart. But you can see the value in terms of, okay, most people um, actually, um, the, a lot of people, of course, you know, named Phoenix, but there was also probably more diversity in terms of the grounded um, mythical creatures selected, basically. And what you want to achieve out of a mind map is um, the ability to not need to necessarily explain, like you would in an Excel spreadsheet, what the data means. So jumping back over here, mirror for research. Um, I'm just going to kind of describe the mechanisms that I tend to use um, that I found particularly useful in my first year of research. So I like to use mind mapping for literature reviews. Um, what I do, um, it's particularly useful when trying to find a research gap, um, is that I post it, note the author and the year of the article, and I only put the description of the findings only, because that's only what I'm looking for. Then I start to group based on common constructs under exploration and move groups based on relatedness to how they associate. So basically, you know, if you're ever in a meeting with your supervisor and they ask, well, what's the literature? What, what are they talking about? You pull up this and you should be able to say it. So in service robots, I can say with mine, okay. So using the key of uh, blue equals empirical, uh, pink equals conceptual, I can see that the majority of empirical work is situated about understanding customer sections of service robots. And right now, the majority of conceptual work is actually looking at the roles. Um, so there's definitely more opportunity to understand the roles of social ro service robots in a more empirical form. However, there is definitely emerging content here in terms of understanding the uh, frontline employee perception of the robot. And basically, I found that super useful in trying to find a research gap because it's really easy to get overwhelmed with just the sheer quantity, um, particularly with the fast paced nature of my research. So I'm gonna whiz through this mind for time. Um, my mapping for constructs. Um, if you're ever in a meeting where um, maybe your supervisor or another colleague asks, well, maybe we should explore this construct. Do you think it's relevant for that? And you're like, great, I have to wrap my mind around another construct. I don't even know if it's gonna be worth it in the end. Mind mapping is your solution. Um, it uh, really allows um, purposeful and timely sense making where you can see how each theory is connected into each other. And it's perfect for, it's rapid mapping for an abandonment scenario. So I need you to understand what role was and all the different theories related to it. In pink, I had more of a marketing lens and in green, I had more of an HR management lens. And I was able to say, okay, investigate this. Okay, that functional role theory comes off that. Well, then what's role theory? Oh, this is this. And basically um, I was able to fully explore um, what role meant and what role theory was if I need to explain it but ultimately I didn't really need it but I'm so much more well versed on it and I was able to do this really really quickly because you're just mind mapping your um, mental processes. And second to last um, I also find uh, visual mapping for journal strategies really effective um, particularly if you're doing PhD by publication you have to be quite strategic about how you go about this but basically I mapped um, for journal service management among others the maturity of my topic, so service robot explanation, on a continuum of conceptual work, then uh, qualitative work, and then quantitative work. And basically from this, I can say that, you know, the maturity of service robot exploration is definitely still emerging. Majority of works are still conceptual. Um, here's the terminology that tends to be used um, in, these, in this journal so that when I go to write it, I reference the right thing. Um, and here are the top editors that are cited in terms of, yeah, I really need to make sure I'm referencing these because everyone's talking about them um, versus those are not so many. And then I've also got if there's um, relevance to my supervisory board as well, if they're um, on the panel or whatnot. And then the last one here, whizzing through, but you have access to all of this to look through afterwards, is I found that it's really important um, and valuable to visualize your research where possible. Um, you know, you have your stage two document or your proposal for masters, but at the end of the day, 
can you sense make it at a glance and be able to talk from it um, quite easily? Probably not. Um, so I found, I've added um, Laurie and some text here, that visualizing how your studies interrelate to each other is super valuable. So for my study one, I had all my research questions here and the method, it was a critical literature review. This leads into this um, study two, research question here, method, which leads into my third study with this method. And being able to come to a supervisor meeting being, hey, okay, this is what I'm doing. They look at it, they remember the conversation, we're good to go. It just enables a much more um, flexible and open-ended conversation because you don't have to flick through um, a whole proposal to remember what you were doing. Uh, additionally, I found, these are all templates I've made. Um, mapping out your actual research design is really useful as well, um, where you can list um, your managerial uh, problem, your research questions, your design, Challenges and limitations, okay, what, you know, maybe it's hard to collect data on this sort of thing, flag that to ask my supervisor, the expected output you want, and maybe the research gaps and contrasts um, you're addressing. So that was a super fast paced kind of um, introduction into how I use mind mapping and neuro for the research process. But this is all still available once this workshop is over. And if you want to learn more about mind mapping, particularly for literature reviews, um, Professor Rebecca Russell Bennett, um, who introduced uh, this workshop as well as she's our supervisor, um, is uh, presenting a really informative workshop this Friday, actually, um, from 12 to 1 p.m. via the Zoom link down here. So make sure you go to that if you would want more information in particular about literature reviews via mind mapping techniques. Fantastic. Awesome. Should we just take the chat quickly? Questions? Fantastic idea. Oh, Dr. Ben Elway has written a book about this. Fantastic. Awesome. <laughs> All right, let's jump into the applications for industry now. So, uh, like we mentioned earlier, there we can use Myra essentially as a toolkit. Um, so, really taking us through the entire double diamond. So, I won't go through too much, um, I, I suppose understanding um, how well versed everybody is um, with human centered design, but it is just a, a way for us to kind of look at the templates that are available um, via the platform. So there's, you know, already a five wise exercise just laid out. Um, there's the empathy canvas that you can just populate, you can get everybody to jump in to really unpack the problem as well as moving towards the solution space. So looking at um, crazy eights, there's dot voting, um, customer journey mapping, even the creation of um, low fidelity um, prototypes or wireframes as well. There's a whole wireframe library. And then also um, actually looking at um, doing a team retro after you've delivered something or creating that delivery plan. Um, but I would like to take you all through customer journey mapping, um, just a real use case, I suppose. So um, customer journey maps in general, try to incorporate how um, an individual experiences um, a service or product from end to end. So looking at their cognitive as well as their emotional and social interactions. Um, and yeah, importantly, it is um, from the customer's perspective too. So one of the examples where um, I used customer journey mapping as part of a research assistant um, project, so looking at trust in the energy sector. So essentially the process was taking it from a template, which was readily available. Um, as we know, the template options are up here. You can just go straight in by just typing customer journey and um, that template itself pops up. Um, and that gives you a good idea of what you do want to include. So you want to include um, the phases of the journey, the actions, so what the customer does, the touch points that they interact with, um, as well as who actually owns that process. And importantly, um, the opportunities as well that you might, as a creative thinker, come up with while you're mapping that journey. And that is um, either typically done in collaboration with customers as well. Um, so for our use case, um, we have it here looking, we um, identified four different jobs to be done within the energy sector. Um, so one of them was actually moving premise. So we um, conveyed the different phases of the journey in terms of how 
um, a customer goes from getting ready to move, move house or move premise to setting up that connection. Um, and in terms of setting up that connection, you know, they actually make a call to the retailer or they greet a contractor at their property. Um, what the customer is thinking within those, within those moments. And you can see just at a glance that either the customer is satisfied or they're really not enjoying their time. Um, as well as the process ownership. So that's particularly useful when it's quite a, a complex system. Um, so understanding who the main uh, responsibility falls under is quite good, as well as, as we can see in a couple of the issues where there are those customer moments of truth, that's typically as well where you can come up with the most opportunities for optimization. And from here, um, the way we approached it was from populating to collaborating. So essentially, um, it was quite easy to set up a Zoom link with some of the industry stakeholders. I think I, I see Kevin Chadwick's mouse on there as well, sorry to single you out. But it was um, quite easy to jump on to the platform and take some of the stakeholders through the customer journey map and collaborate in real time. Um, even, you know, be, be able to just write some notes to myself to say, okay, go back and fix this, or this is a new point. So looking at that user testing as well in real time. Um, and then once that collaboration and once, once it was fully populated, we were able to actually communicate that within our um, roadmap report. So as you can see here, it's definitely most definitely been beautified thanks to the help of our visual designer but um, it, it's just a way for us to I, I suppose show, show you the process from taking it from a template to populating and in some instances that may be all that really needs to occur um, in terms of just helping you or your organization um, just wrap your head around the problem space or um, taking it that one step further if it is something that you need to communicate. And just quickly as well, um, this is actually a nifty little integration in terms of uploading files. So I've actually been able to upload that entire report in here. Um, and you can actually scroll through the different pages um, if need be, as well as extracting the pages. So um, that's what I did here to pull out this specific page. Um, I knew what page it was, pressed extract, um, so that's a way of, again, integrating um, other elements of your, of your existing work within um, the one-stop one shop, I suppose. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a brief introduction in terms of the research applications as well as the industry applications of Miro as well. Uh, I might just jump into the chat just to check that's going good awesome just chelsea <laughs> yeah. all right fabulous so that kind of concludes the um more formal trajectory of this workshop and we have about 10 minutes to spare which is awesome uh which will direct towards just more questions and um clarifying any concerns you have um First of all, we'd love to thank you uh, for jumping on. Uh, this is definitely an experiment for us in terms of testing our experience with Miri as a tool in having this workshop. And I think to say it's probably something we'll both be using in the yeah. future um, as it's a really valuable tool, especially in this age of working from home, um, but also collaborating meaningfully online. Uh, as such, we'd love to get your feedback on your experience of the workshop today. Um, understanding what you liked about the workshop, feel free to add a post-it note. Um, what you learned from the workshop, um, what were the valuable things that you took away? Uh, what you lamented? Um, what could have been done better in your opinion? Um, we are open to constructive criticism. <laughs> um, and lacked, is there any parts of the workshop that you really um, thought needed to be addressed um, with the technical feasibility of Miro? So um, as we kind of continue the Q&A, feel free to populate that below. Um, but are there any questions at all about what we've discussed today or wanted to explore any other um, technical feasibilities of this software at all? I know we definitely rushed through a couple of elements as well, just being conscious of time, but um, we're more than happy to discuss a couple of things further as well.
Everybody's just going straight to the poster notes. I love them to see. I love the four L's. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Practical approach. Thank you so much. Software. <laughs> Best stuff came after the break. We agree. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Learned a lot more about neurofunctionality. Great to hear. Love the PDF export. I don't know about the word. voting function. Yes. Um, I will say that um, it is probably worth, from a teaching perspective, um, to really explore the premium option. Um, I was able to get the premium uh, profile for free um, because of the educational um, context of why I was using it. So down, um, if anyone's interested, I've included the link. Where is premium? There it goes. I've included the link to explore the education plan right down here. Um, as I do think it is very valuable to use in class. We've used it over in the design school quite a bit. And it really does help in class collaboration, especially if you're teaching over Zoom or even in person as well. Um, so definitely explore that as it is, in my opinion, um, really worthwhile. And uh, another thing as well, there are um, a lot to, um, a, a lot of explanatory videos as well created by um, the developers as well. So there's a lot of self-serve um, videos and things like that as well. Definitely acknowledge that it was a bit quick. So um, we would have loved to make it probably a bit of a longer workshop too, but uh, maybe something we can consider in the future too. Definitely maybe more of a um, deep more dive. advanced yeah. deep dive. Um, but it definitely, there's things we're learning about Miro every day, I would mm. say. Um, <laughs> and definitely in playing this workshop, um, Alex said to me, oh, we should do this. And I'm like, Miro can do that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now I've learned something. So um, we definitely hope that you kind of um, have that experience as well um, when you explore Miro yourself. Was there any lamenting that happened? Let's have a look as well so we know. Any. Not too much that lacked at this stage. It's good to hear. <laughs> um, uh, another quick thing as well that w w one of the things um, Chelsea and I discovered too is like in Word or PowerPoint, there is also a function to be able to align content, mm. which we thought was quite good. So for example, um, pressing shift on everything and then um, you're able, oh, that's just grouped them, but aligning them in the middle just in terms of beautifying a few things as well so it saves a lot of time <laughs> definitely but yeah we'll um ha have a bit of a go and potentially try and export some of them the pdf um files from this presentation and potentially distribute those around if that's something um you would all like as well so sure. and there's some um, mirror board will be kept open um for a while we're not deleting it anytime soon so if you need a reference point for any information feel free to just head back into it and thank you all a lot for your collaboration because that's definitely what makes it a workshop rather than um just a lecture i suppose <laughs> so really great to see you all jumping in